If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up that diet rule book, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host of this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and a mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. Let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion. Let's shake things up a bit and let's change the game. You're listening to Pumpkin Spice by AudioBinger, available at audiobinger.net and freemusicarchive.org. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode. A couple reminders, you can pick up Body Kindness wherever books and audiobooks are sold to get help breaking free from diets and body shame and create a better life. And you can get started now with a free four-week Body Kindness program. Just visit bodykindnessbook.com slash start, and you'll get instant access to my video on health rules you should break, and a journal track self-care habits instead of calories burned and consumed, because we all know that intensive self-monitoring does not create a better life. If you're a helping professional and podcast listener, I want to hear from you. Shoot me an email, rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com, and say hello. If you can kick some cash into the production kitty, please visit gofundme.com slash bodykindness. Now onto the show, I have Dr. Jennifer Webb back today. She is a health psychologist and researcher at UNC Charlotte's Mind Batch Lab, which studies mindfulness and well-being. Now, you might remember that we collaborated last year on a study examining mindful self-care and depressive symptoms in pregnancy and up to five years postpartum. Well, we're sharing outcomes of their work today and advice you can use. Really, it's good advice for anyone, uh, but especially if you or you know someone who is in that pregnancy or postpartum window, I hope that you will consider passing this podcast episode on to them. Dr. Webb received her bachelor's degree in cognitive neuroscience from Harvard University a master's in psychology from the University of Southern California, and her PhD in psychology also from the University of Southern California. Thanks so much for listening once again and enjoy the show. Hey, Jennifer, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi, it's great to be here again. I am so glad to have you back on the show is that you might actually be my first repeat guest now that I think about it. That's exciting. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm just like humbled. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a lot of really good stuff. Last time we chatted, it was last year, um, episode 84 for the listeners who have not heard it yet. We talked about body image flexibility and how we could um, gain insight from the current research on self-compassion and positive body image. And that's also where we announced uh, that we would be doing some research work together with the Body Kindness Philosophy in your lab. Um, which has been amazing. Oh my goodness. It really has. (laughs) Yeah. And so we're back to kind of talk all about that um, in our show today around negative body image, depression, and mindful self-care for women in pregnancy and postpartum. Yes. Um, But to get us started, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your lab and your work for the benefit of the listeners to kind of get connected to where we're at with things. Oh, certainly. Well, thank you for that recap. It's so helpful. (laughs) Our lab is uh, sort of affectionately coined Mind Batch, and it's it's an acronym. So it, it tries to help understand how we can live better in our bodies, regardless of what our bodies look like. And so we've spent a lot of time focusing primarily on understanding the experiences of college women from diverse groups in terms of living in bodies that are of higher weight, for example, and also looking at how yoga can be a vehicle for helping individuals of higher weight during the college years 
be able to live as well as they can and live in, in an embodied way and in a meaningful way. So that's one of the areas that we've been working on, as well as looking at self-compassion, intuitive eating, mindful eating, also in college women. And what we wanted to realize is that there are women along the whole trajectory of the lifespan <laughs> yep. that also you know, could benefit from these approaches. And so this really has been amazing to be able to open up our research program to now include more of an emphasis on the experiences of women during pregnancy, as well as in the postpartum, since these are really, really important issues these days. Absolutely. And I mean, it's an anecdotal in my lived experience, but I got to tell you, yoga really was fundamental in helping me heal my body image. It's yeah. literally where I feel like I heard the word self-compassion and began to understand what they actually meant. Yes. And and yeah, I, I'm very grateful for how <clears throat> yoga was able to serve a beneficial purpose in my life and like really foster this idea of connection and well-being and self-care for your body just as it is. It, it, it like it's a form of resilience to our culture that tells everybody, especially women, that you're not good enough unless you're spending tons of time and money working on yourself. But especially right. as your body mass index grows, you get less and less of a of a pass by culture to be considered healthy or well or, you know, even a good person. So you, you know, you're right. This is this is serious stuff and real important if we're talking about health and well-being of Indeed. people. Yeah. Indeed. And I'm so grateful that you're doing the work. I would love to hear a little bit more of a recap of the research goals in in this as you were talking about transitioning from like well-being and for women in pregnancy in the postpartum period. So, what was the idea behind it? Yeah, the idea was really driven by a lot of these sociocultural messages and pressures that women during pregnancy and the postpartum now have to focus more on what their body looks like as opposed to experiencing all the amazing changes that the body's going through at these different phases. So the, the focus has been more on appearance and needing to sort of be the sort of hot pregnant woman <laughs> or the hot new mom, you know, as opposed to really experiencing the full range of of being during these amazing times in our lives. And so there had been research coming out, you know, looking at the experience of body image specifically um, during pregnancy mm -hmm. and the postpartum, but also recognizing that the lens through which that was being looked at even in the research was relatively limited. And so more research recently is looking at, hey, women are experiencing a lot of depression, anxiety during pregnancy and the postpartum. Hey, could how they're experiencing their body be part of that picture. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the, the the inroads that our lab was really curious about is better understanding those sort of the, how they kind of feed off of each other, that if we're not feeling good about the body that we're in at these life stages, that that certainly could you know affect our mood um, and how our, our emotional life, but also that our emotional life could also affect our experience of the changes that the body is going through um, during these periods. And so we drew in a really a, a wonderful model that Dr. Catherine Cook Catoni at the University of Buffalo uh, developed with her colleagues called the attunement model of wellness and embodied self regulation. And essentially, what that is saying is that we have our internal world and we have our external world. And we're trying to negotiate all the things happening on inside of us, our thoughts, emotions, physical sensations. But we're also trying to meet the needs of, of people we care about outside of ourselves, in our family, our community, and our culture. So what she and her colleagues have really put on the table is that embodiment, those practices like yoga, like meditation, like body kindness, <laughs> really are instrumental in helping us to live effectively in navigating our internal and external worlds. And so the, the terminology that she has come up with is called mindful self-care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it overlaps actually with body kindness. So there's so much synergy there, <laughs> you know, just in terms of these mind-body relational practices mm -hmm. that are really targeted in living in your body the best way you can and being able to empower yourself to take care of yourself in order to be able to take, to take care of others that matter to you. And so we wanted to combine her model with, again, this idea that we need to pay more attention to the experiences of women during pregnancy and the postpartum with regard to their mood, their affect, as well as their body and how they're experiencing it to sort of see, you know, does it sort of make sense that when you look at mood and you look at self-care, that 
the way you're experiencing your body could be one of the factors linking the two. And so that was sort of a novel twist that hadn't been looked at yet. And particularly in women, not only during pregnancy and the postpartum, but it was also, I, I thanks to you, uh, Rebecca, <laughs> for your wisdom and also extending our sample to also include women who had children between ages one to five. And I think that's a, a, even understudy population is sort of thinking, oh, after that first year postpartum, then, oh, everything's back to normal, right? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I'm like, selfishly, I happen to match that cohort of two kids, <laughs> one to five. Um, yeah. Just saying. But yeah, but it's, it's everything old is new again. And it was so interesting about what you're talking about is this idea of, I mean, it really is pervasive, right? Like you, it's inescapable, the messages that women get about their bodies really, I mean, it could start super early, let's be honest, three, four, five years old, but definitely by puberty when we become these objects, oh, you got to control, you know, and this is how you fit in. And then it's like, there's this, you know, you get through puberty and then this one time where you're supposed to gain weight for health and well-being. And what do we get attacked with are these messages about getting your post-baby body back or even, yes. you know, we've seen the celebrities, but I would say maybe one of the most recent ones would be, okay, why am I drawing a blank on her name? Because she's now- Marina Williams? Well, well, oh yeah, but she pushes back. Yes. So I appreciate her pushback, but she, yeah, she's been held um, sort of to this special standard about how fast her body can come back and how fast can she get back in the game. Even questions they ask her is not seeing her as like like the best tennis player athlete, but more yes. like female or as a mom, right? All these yes. conditions. Qualifiers, oh, yes. Yeah. I was thinking of Kate Hudson who oh, just yes. had a baby and then became the spokesperson for WW, right? And so, and, and again, it's like the, the message that you're sending with respect to, you know, here, I've got to get my baby's body back. And when you look at the focus of, is this really about well-being? Is this accessible to women right. of all sizes? And yes. it, it, is it intersectional, you know? like, That's right. And it is, it's really important. I was just thinking of, you know, you see things that come off as trends. And one of them was like on Instagram. This happened after my kids, thank goodness. But it was, <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but you basically show a butt pic and it's, you're not supposed to be able to tell that you're pregnant from behind. And that's literally wow. like a contest. Wow. So it's like a badge of honor. Like if you show your silhouette from behind and then you do like a back and a front pick or, you know, it's just weird. I mean, and, and, and just to watch, to see people sort of unwittingly engage in it because we don't do enough to question the culture. Like it's the yes. system and the structure that's a problem, not me. And so I've gotten more and more where I do not blame individuals for what they're participating in because it really makes sense. But yes. how do we help people see that the system and the structure is problematic so that we can really help that help them, you know, kind of point that sword at the culture and say, hey, I'm not the problem. And actually when I feel space to to be who I am, a vulnerable exactly as I am today, even if I want to change things, if I have permission to be here, I'm more likely to kind of want to hold myself with kindness and say, like, what's what is one thing I can do in this moment as a tired mom who's just trying to find her identity as a mom and caregive for someone else? So it's a really big cultural problem and a big undertaking that greatly is lacking in research, which is why I'm so grateful for the work that your lab is doing. Oh, goodness. Grateful for our, our collaboration, which made this happen. <laughs> well, can you share a little bit about what you found in the initial research? Oh, sure. That would be great to know. Okay. So based on uh, amazing recruitment efforts on your part, we were able to obtain a sample of women, uh, primarily from the United States, who were interested in learning more about body kindness and also sharing their experiences, um, both sort of reviewing uh, your book, but also completing a few questionnaires that were looking at, you know, symptoms of depression, looking at uh, certain experiences of body and weight uh, concern, mm -hmm. as well as uh, this measure, new measure of mindful self-care. And so in our initial analyses, what we did was sort of look at the basic relationships, you know, among those variables. And what we were able to find is in our sample, 
sample, which um, for purposes of this particular data was 77 women. And that is divided up into uh, roughly 20 women who were in the first year postpartum, 19 during pregnancy, and the remaining 38, again, had children that were between ages one to five. Mm -hmm. And so in this sample, we were able to, to demonstrate that, not surprisingly, that the experiences of how they're relating to their body in, in a negative way was correlated positively with how depressed they were feeling, as well as it was negatively correlated with caring for yourself in a mindful way. And then when you kind of put all those three pieces together, mm -hmm. it looked like the body experience was helping to explain why depression was related to mindful self-care. So mindful self-care and depression were negatively related and how you experience your body was helping to explain that, which, which again was a novel finding. They weren't really looking at those kinds of relationships previously. Wow. It's, it's so amazing to have some data behind that. And yet, you know, again, as, as a mom, it also makes sense. You know, yes. I, I'm a mom with a job and resources and yeah, it is still hard, right? To hear the messages, to feel the fatigue, to, you know, to see how your life is evolving, right? You're already trying to learn how to do the mothering thing. Yes. And then, so if you're not feeling positive emotions or optimism, like feeling like you can handle it or you're, you know, like a sense of, of feeling good about the journey, right? Yeah. Then we look to kind of cope, you know, like I need to explain this negative emotion. And absolutely, we've been conditioned since like one years old to <laughs> turn that into maybe some type of body bash or I'm not good yes. enough, right? And so you could see where I would almost wonder does is is there a chicken and an egg or it doesn't right. matter because they fuel each other? That's right. And and that's actually what research is suggesting. Mm -hmm. So our study, again, is is novel, but it's also very preliminary because mm -hmm. it's based on sort of that one, you know, snapshot in time. Right. So some of the prospective research, which has actually followed women, uh, for example, during pregnancy and the early postpartum, have shown that there is sort of this bi-directional relationship between mm -hmm. sort of negative body image and symptoms of depression. And so there's a lot of, of like you're saying, it's kind of a dynamic process. So mm -hmm. if you're experiencing depression during pregnancy, it's also likely that that will predict how you feel about your body in the postpartum yeah. and how you feel about your body in the postpartum can predict later on in the postpartum, your level of depression. Yeah. So it's exactly, they do feed off of each other. And, and the thing is, is we have to remember that depression, there's a lot of shame around depression. Yes. I think we have a lot of views that it it must mean that you don't even want to get out of bed and you know you know what i mean where you could be walking around acting like everything is fine because you're putting on a mask for people but yeah. you could be depressed but yeah. thinking that you're not even worthy of seeking an insight or care to that that's right which is so problematic because depression also has very good treatments yes you know including things you can do for yourself and that's and right. support so it's it's almost like seeing this as a if we can get some more data behind it, we can get some more effective treatments from the clinician standpoint, but from, as you were mentioning earlier, families and communities and yes. just how we see this lived experience of what it means to become a mother and a family and care for ourselves and for each other. It's really yes. exciting, actually. It is exciting. And it's it's amazing timing also, because in the last week, week and a half, mm -hmm. the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force on Preventing Perinatal Depression mm -hmm. uh, put out a statement. And that statement was, was, we looked at all the literature, which was looking at sort of psychological treatments for mm -hmm. women who are experiencing depression during pregnancy and the postpartum. And what they were saying is, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. has a significant level of evidence that it should be something that clinicians are encouraging once they're actually hopefully screening women. That's the other part, mm -hmm. right? They actually have to <laughs> actually have the conversations and, and screen women um, during this th these phases. But also that CBT is sort of has enough evidence that we want more women to get exposed to it um, so that that could be another resource among like these other resources that you're talking about right. that they can turn to. 
Right. And like one, just for listeners, one one example of CBT is this idea of of noticing a thought that you're having. Like mm. so in body kind of call it the inner critic, right? Yeah. So you notice a thought that you're having and to be able to be aware that that how that thought is making you feel. And yes. then to be able to think of a way that you can respond to that thought. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I like acceptance commitment therapy or ACT, yeah. which is which is known as a third wave of CBT. And I'm That's not right. sure comparatively how much, you know, like do you do you take ACT principles and say, well, that would fall under CBT or keep them separate? I'm not exactly sure. But I know that they're pretty closely related and they have to yes. – a lot of, of what they have to do with is like dialoguing with your thoughts and feelings so that you can make choices that enhance your well-being. So that's – that all would be very good if you can imagine that context of how, you know, when you're not feeling good about your body or not feeling good about your ability to mother, how you might be able to deal with those thoughts and feelings in positive ways. Indeed. And like you're saying, that that ACT and other third wave approaches that incorporate mindfulness, mm-hmm. again, are, you know, have definitely been showing some uh, emerging support also in, among women during, particularly during pregnancy. They're integrating more mindfulness within CBT mm-hmm. and mindfulness-based stress reduction programs. Um, so again, I, I think that's another sort of domain that's emerging that our preliminary research would also help to support, given that you know, we were looking at mindful (laughs) self-care. Right, right. And so besides this wonderful podcast, we are also going to be sharing the information elsewhere, which is super exciting to me. So can you let the listeners know what is literally happening the week this podcast comes out? (laughs) Exactly. Well, we are so fortunate that this research was accepted for presentation as as during a poster session at the 40th annual um, meeting and scientific sessions of the Society of Behavioral Medicine. And again, uh, SBM, as it's known for short, um, tends to bring together a a wonderful sort of interdisciplinary perspective um, from, you know, professionals from diverse backgrounds as it relates to sort of psychology, medicine, public health, nutrition, um, and, and, and others as well. It's just, it's an amazing opportunity to sort of cross fertilize so that it's not, we're not staying siloed just within, for example, psychology or health psychology, but can hopefully sort of increase awareness, you know, across different disciplines. Um, and this year it's actually in DC and at the Washington Hilton. So we're, we're so excited to be able to have this opportunity to share our work further. Right. And I'm so excited to hear how people respond to it. And, you know, it's like that planting seeds, right? That's you right. know, so that's, I, I just think that this work is so important and meaningful. And it's, it, it, you're right, it is an honor to be able to share that. And as we know how it goes in research, there's always more work and funding that's needed. Yes. <laughs> so I'd love to hear from your perspective based on the outcomes of this. And, you know, where where do you think the work and funding should go um, based on the evidence you have so far? Like, what would you like to see happen? Well, certainly, as we're thinking about, you know, women during pregnancy and the postpartum, for example, that there's such, it's such an amazing time, but also there's a a lot of busyness, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of what we're hoping is that not only you know, noticing that the evidence base, for example, for CBT, you know, has reached a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. But we also want to think about how it's delivered, for example, Mm -hmm. right, so that it can reach more women and be effective so that it's maybe not based on the traditional models of care. So that's great if you are able to uh, go to sort of face-to-face services um, in person. But it's also neat to sort of see some of the, the, the funding going more a little bit more to developing uh, interventions that can be disseminated, for example, through technology, Mm -hmm. um, through other sort of guided self-help models. Mm -hmm. So again, it wouldn't necessarily be that you'd have to come in to see see the person you're working with. You might be able to interact with them over the phone or via internet or through text messages. So I think that's really a neat area in contemporary research now that we're trying to sort of extend the reach of these evidence-based approaches so that it's it's not just being held for those who are able to come in for those face-to-face meetings. So that that would certainly be one area. Yeah, that's it's a massive area too because you're talking about access, right? Yes. So what we're really talking about is our common humanity and who gets access to care. And so what's the point of all this research and all this evidence if yes. only the people who have the disposable time and money yes. to go to in-person, face-to-face therapeutic sessions? We've yes. got to find a way 
to include everyone and the most marginalized, the most time starved, the most economically disadvantaged, they deserve to get access to this help. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Indeed. Any plans for more body kindness related research that you're thinking on or able to share right now? Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, actually, uh, this is also news to you. I don't oh. think we mentioned this yet. <laughs> We're, uh, I have an awesome doctoral student who is in the process of developing her dissertation research. And so she is really interested in the application of body kindness among college women. Ah. So that is really hot off the press. <laughs> that is hot, hot, hot off the press. That's exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I can't. Can't wait. I'm super excited. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to have to find out more about that one. <laughs> There's any help I could give. Let me know. Um, anyway, so we have maybe a minute or two left based on, I mean, I know you're a mother as well, and you're yes. obviously an expert in, in health psychology and you, you do research on mindful self-care and like, what are just some top key takeaways you, somebody's listening right now who's in the pregnancy postpartum and yeah, they feel like, yeah, my, my body's a problem. I feel like I'm at this rock bottom place and, and how can you help me? What, what would you want to say to them right now? Well, first of all, I think as we were talking about really just trying to normalize that it makes so much sense why you would be having these thoughts and feelings about your body, given the broader culture. So part of it is the fact that you're even aware of how you're feeling, that to me is, is a good thing, even though it might not feel good. So with that knowledge, you can then have, think about what you can do with that information and sort of recognizing that this is an opportunity, again, even though it could feel as if um, you don't have anything that you can do. Mm -hmm. So thinking about certain support resources that are out there, there's um, resources that are available online, for example, through the American Pregnancy Association, um, Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Women's Mental Health also has some great online resources. Um, and also for women during the postpartum, there's Postpartum Support International. So those are some other uh, resources that could be helpful. But recognizing that your experience, though challenging, is also potentially an opportunity to sort of figure out sort of how you want to be at this particular stage of your life, thinking about becoming a mom, thinking about, you know, what type of values you want to embody mm -hmm. um, for that, the, the, that child or other children that you might have. So those would be some tips I would, I would think about sort of that awareness, sort of having compassion because it makes sense given the culture we live in and considering what action you can take to get the support that you need. Yeah. I, I love that viewpoint too, because I feel often when we are when women are falling into the caregiver role, it's we say things like, "Oh, I don't want to bother them," or "Oh, I shouldn't." Not you know, other people need me, and it, it ends up being some version of you're eventually saying like, "I have no needs." Yes, and, <laughs> right. And the reality yes. is, you do have needs, and there's a reason why in counseling, I literally have in my cabinet an airplane oxygen mask. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> so at the right time, exactly. At the right time, I'll bring it out and and it, it never fails. I bring it out, have them soften their eyes, put it in their hands. Yes. And most everyone cries because they really, they really get it. They understand that they know, they know the script of secure your mask for helping others. I, I'll even show a picture of my kids and say, imagine my child is sitting next to you. How yeah. hard would that be to yeah. put your own mask on first? And, and they'll say, yeah, it would feel impossible, but why do you need to? That's right. It's so I can breathe to help others. And, and so metaphors and reminders like yes. that can be really helpful. And then the other thing I would add, and I want to quote Sharon Salzberg as a person who says this, but she says, if you can breathe, you can meditate. Yes. And, and that really was life-changing for me because I always had this vision of like, I'm not a meditator. I have monkey mind, you know, all, all this resistance, <laughs> you know, except for the very end of yoga class and Savasana, then suddenly I could finally relax. <laughs> But from that mindset, if you can breathe, you can meditate. So just like put, putting my hands on my heart, like that's what I would tell a listener. Put, mm -hmm. Just right now, put your hands on your heart and just, and just soften your eyes and just feel that connection skin to skin, but also with breath. And just if you can take 30 seconds and just count a slow inhale and exhale and feel that connection that that, that is meditation, that, that's emotion regulation, right? Yes. And that shows that you have what it takes to do maybe the next thing that's harder 
in the searching for resources and, and getting appointments right. and things like that's that. Right. So, and I think that's such a nice compliment to something that uh, Kristen Neff and her self-compassion break mm-hmm. is, is very complimentary. It's sort of recognizing that, you know, this is a moment of suffering. It, it's hard right now. Mm-hmm. And recognizing that that's the mindfulness part. Then there's the common humanity part, you know, others, I'm not alone. There's other women out there feeling the same way. Mm-hmm. And then the third part, again, is can I be kind to myself right now? So I still can have a choice of how I want to treat myself amidst awareness and amidst recognizing that I'm not alone. Yeah. And all of Kristen Neff's work was <laughs> fundamental when I was coming up with the body kindness pillars. It was, you know, if if nothing else, it's your willingness to cultivate an inner caregiver voice. Yeah, that's and right. you can't, you, you know, you can't do that without understanding the benefits of self-compassion in, in your life. Um, Jennifer, this has been so great. I want to make sure that um, in the show notes, I'll include a link to your research lab where people can read some of your recent and relevant papers. Is there anything else you want to let listeners know about your work or where they could find you uh, before we say goodbye today? Oh, no. I think... uh that information will be great in terms of uh, ResearchGate is where a lot of our work is. And mm-hmm. I'll make sure that you have that link. I also just wanted to mention if, if listeners are interested in some other, in addition to body kindness, obviously, some other resources that could be useful during this time that our lab has um, been uh, either reviewing ourselves or might be including in research in the future, potentially. There's some self-help books that focus on mindfulness specifically during motherhood. And one of them is uh, Shonda Morales' uh, Breathe Mama Breathe. It has a lot of wonderful, short, brief mindfulness practices for the busy moms and moms-to-be. And then Mindful Motherhood is actually an evidence-based approach self-help book by Dr. Cassandra Vision, where, again, it's sort of based on mindfulness-based stress reduction, but it's specifically for women who are preparing to have have a child as well as in the early postpartum. And then one other book that our lab has been having so much fun with, it's called Like a Mother, A Feminist Journey Through the Science and Culture of Pregnancy by Angela Agarbez. Again, it's, it's just sort of this really eye-opening and just such well-written uh, uh, exploration of a lot of the mixed messages that women experience and a lot of disempowerment that women experience mm-hmm. um, during, during this time and different ways of being able to sort of regain power as well. I love that. Those are all going to go in my cart and I will include the links to every one of those in the show notes as well as a link to your research lab. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. (laughs) Bye-bye. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search body kindness and request to join the group for body kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.